Well, hello and uh, welcome to this particular class, class which I had yesterday said uh, is going to be one of those funny things where I will be teaching two people and their ideas and these two people nor their ideas have anything to do with each other. I jokingly said that uh, this class is like what you find in the Asterix comic Asterix and uh, the Chieftain's Shield, where you have merchants selling wine and charcoal. And uh, here I am talking to you today about Arna Ness and also about Ronald Dorkin. Now, first and foremost, uh, my apologies for the quality of my voice. I don't know what has happened. I suddenly woke up with this voice. So, you can't do much about things which are not really in your control, can you? So, not only am I dealing with people who are as different as wine and charcoal, I'm also treating ideas of these people which are very, very different and have nothing to do with each other. Arna Ness is somebody who spoke about things which are today, at the time he spoke, maybe they were great ideas, new ideas, I don't know. But right now, these are ideas about the environment, which everybody knows and nobody cares about. So that is the beauty of this. So for ages, people have been doing whatever they want to do to the environment. And uh, people have been hearing them. But now it's all become noise. Nobody gives two hoots about the environment. Maybe if Greta Thunberg speaks about uh, the environment, somebody will listen to her because of the novelty factor involved with a teenager telling the grown-ups of this world as to what to do with the environment. So that is extremely good for Greta Thunberg, but we are not studying Greta Thunberg, not that there is much to study about her. We'll be, after looking at Arna Ness, we will be looking at uh, the profound uh, 
legal philosopher, if I may call him so, uh, a towering man in the world of jurisprudence. And uh, the ideas that we will be talking about are those of Ronald Dorkin. So if you take my uh, image, uh, not image, I'm sorry, that is not the correct word. Uh, if you take into consideration the analogy that I have used, which is wine and charcoal, we should be starting with Aniness, who is charcoal, and uh, Ronald Dorkin is super fine wine, absolutely top class. But that reminds me of Roland Barth, the Frenchman, who basically said that wine was nothing but a cheap drink. And uh, it was made out to be a connoisseur's drink by ads which involved another Greta, Greta of the past, not the Greta of the present, Greta Garbo, the Hollywood actress. So he basically said that there is a lot of myth around wine. So perhaps I shouldn't be using that metaphor on Ronald Dorkin because there's nothing, there's no mythification of the image of Dorkin. He earned the respect that the world gives him today. So let me not sound condescending to Arna Ness. Well, like I said, perhaps now this is all old hat, but I have to teach it because I have to, despite uh, not having any audience at all, which makes the job a little difficult because you have to imagine that you're speaking to someone and uh, that complicates things. But doesn't matter. One lives with one's reality. And uh, so we shall proceed with ecologism, which is what we started yesterday. And uh, we did, we talked about two people, Garrett Harding and uh, his two metaphors, I guess, of the lifeboat, and the swimmers and the spacecraft, spaceship Earth, both of which, in my opinion, are extremely poor metaphors. And like I said, Wikipedia is uh, making big thing, big people out of those who probably don't deserve that stature. 
but then I'm being judgmental, so I shall suspend uh, my judgment. That would have applied even to old old Leopold. Uh, neither of them basically talk about ecologism, though they are being talked about in the larger context about ecologism. They are talking about capitalism, the rich countries and poor countries, and the availabilities of availability, sorry, of resources to people. So that is hardly ecologism because ecolo by definition yesterday we had seen that ecologism is going beyond man uh, beyond the human being before the feminists pounce on me uh, going beyond the human beings and their uh, having taken over the planet and looking at ecology as something that needs to look at other forms of life as well. It's not all about Homo sapiens. It is also about the other species that uh, inhabit the earth. But they are both the people that we I talked about, Garrett Harding and uh, Aldo Leopold, basically are talking about the distribution of resources the cornering of resources by some countries, the rich nations, as Harding calls them, and the non-availability of those resources to other countries, the poor countries, the swimmers, in uh, Harding's writing. Well, Ananus, let me write down his name here. Ananus is a um, a Norwegian, as the name itself will tell you. Now let's get into a little bit ab about uh, pronunciations. Uh, the natural urge that we people, at least in India, will have is to call him either Arnes or Arnenes, but it is, I'm told, the correct pronunciation is Arna and AE indicates something in between the A sound, which is short and uh, the A sound, which is drawn out, it is somewhere in between that. So it's not Arna Ness. And it is not Arna Ness. It is Arna Ness. Ness, not Ness, not Ness, Ness. That is how I'm, this is the advantage, one advantage of 
not having an audience, you can enjoy yourself teaching, talking about things which perhaps would otherwise have drawn the ire of an audience, a live audience. Hopefully somebody sees these videos. Okay. So, Arna Ness, sorry, I made that mistake. Arna Ness is somebody who talked about deep ecology. And uh, perhaps, unlike the predecessors, or is it predecessors, whatever it is, so let's say predecessors that we talked about, Aldo Leopold and Garrett Harding, actually he has an equal argument about the present preservation of the environment and uh, the preservation of the ecology. And this is an argument which goes beyond human beings. It goes beyond the usual trite categories of poverty and richness and the inequitable distribution uh, he seems to have spared us the agony of going through those old categories which I've been hearing since I was born, and I was born a very, very long time ago. I have forgotten how long ago. I'm not exactly a vampire living forever. Definitely not an original who will never die, who can't be killed. But I, I have lost track of how old I am. All I know is that I am positively ancient. And I've been hearing that argument about distribution right from the time that I could understand languages. So, thankfully, Arna Ness, Ness, sorry, uh, spares us that detail. And having spared us that detail, there is not any great profundity of any kind attached to his ideas. But nevertheless, uh, I think because we have to study it, we will study it. Uh, deep ecology believes that the natural world, which is not the unnatural world, and if you think uh, I'm joking about an unnatural world, there is an unnatural world, and that is the cities in which we live. These are unnatural. This, they have grown at the expense of nature. So the natural world is a good thing to talk about since we live in a very, very unnatural world. And uh, some of us are unaware of the fact that we live in an unnatural world uh, because of the fact that we don't pay attention to what is being said. WhatsApp is a 
what you get in on the WhatsApp university is more important than what you get in other universities. So, not many are aware of the unnatural world. Now, deep ecology believes that the natural world is a complex web of relationships between Uh, this is a complex relationship, sorry, not between, why did I write that, uh, in which the existence of organisms is dependent on the existence of other kinds of organisms other kinds of organisms uh, within within the ecological system. I deliberately called it an ecological system. People use the term ecosystem. I don't want to talk about that because ecosystem now has very little to do with ecology. It has got everything to do with, let us say, a, an ecosystem that nurtures the growth of non-fossil fuel developed but uh, non-fossil fuel driven vehicles, which are essentially electrical vehicles. So we have to create an ecosystem to charge electricity, uh, sorry, to charge these vehicles whenever they run out of electricity from the batteries. So, or you nurture an eco, create and nurture people in an ecosystem to fall in line with a certain kind of thinking. So ecosystem is everywhere. Everything is an ecosystem. Uh, there's also an ecosystem of lies. If you pay attention to what people speak, you'll see how much of lies are there. So there is an ecosystem of that as well. Again, we don't know about it, just as we don't know about the unnatural world. Uh, so the ecosystem that we are talking about here is the ecological system. I de deliberately use the full uh, full word rather than cut it short to eco. And um, I'm not going to talk about silos, which is which seems to be the next uh, which is next most used uh, metaphor or analogy. So, People should not be sitting in silos. They should come out and become a part of the ecosystem. 
which is in concrete buildings. So that is not what we are talking about. And so the ecological system or the usage of the ecological system. Now, many years ago, on Ness was concerned was concerned about the destruction of uh, the natural world and uh, the threat it poses not only to human beings, but to all organisms which constitute the natural world. I am tempted to put order behind the world but we don't have a natural world order anymore. It's become extremely disorderly, thanks to us. We are an amazing species. We have taken over the world. We have taken over this planet. And now we are looking at destroying the world. So, why does Arna Ness, Arna Ness talk about deep ecology? Arna Ness You must forgive me if I don't always pronounce the ness properly. Anna ness basically is an environmentalist. And uh, his ideas of the ecology are called uh, deep, <clears throat> sorry, deep uh, ecology for the basic reason that he is going past the human beings and uh, <clears throat> looking organisms, some of which we know nothing about, 
we do not even know that some organisms actually exist and it is our ignorance of these organisms that makes us into this destructive species that we are. Now let me disabuse you of a problem that you might be facing with the usage of the term organisms. Normally, when we talk about organisms, what are we talking about? We are talking about organisms as small worms, insects, and also probably microbial organisms that are not even visible to the eye. And uh, <clears throat> that is not what uh, I'm saying when we say we do not even know that some organisms actually exist. We're not talking about microbials. Let's be very clear about that. We are talking about the visible animal kingdom and the visible natural order, which has become invisible to us. That draws me to uh, uh, that draws me to a particular uh, analogy that was used by Robert Persig in a book that came out in the 1980s, a book that was uh, called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It had very little to do with motorcycle maintenance and it had everything to do with philosophy. Now, there are many metaphors that uh, Robert Persig uses in that particular work. And I'm not going to go into all of them. You don't need them. But I would like to tell, use one particular uh, one particular metaphor where he says it is better to ride a motorcycle than to drive a motor car or it is even yeah, not it is even even when it comes to being driven around it is better to be driven around on a motorcycle rather than a car. Because Persig basically says that when you are in a car, it's the wind shield in front of you and uh, the door windows and nowadays we all sit in air conditioned cars so most of us keep the glasses up for the windows of the doors he says they are all like televisions it's like looking at 
a television, a world being shown on a television. Whereas, if you actually look at what you see on a motorcycle, if you sit on a motorcycle, you're one with the elements. You get to see more of the environment around you, which you don't get to see if you're in a car. Let me just give you a small sob story of mine. When I had uh, developed a very severe back problem and it continues to exist, for many days I couldn't walk. For many years, I'm sorry, I couldn't walk beyond my, the rooms of my house. So everywhere I went, I went by car. And I used to tell everyone, I'm an avid motorcycle rider, a two-wheeler rider. I rode scooters as well. Um, and I used to tell people that fate has kicked me up the social ladder. I had become someone who needed a car and a driver. And uh, I used to travel in the car and most of the time sit in the back seat and see what's happening. In the front, you get some kind of a view. And uh, after many years, when I could, uh, I was permitted to walk a bit outside of the house with a stick. I went for a walk in my street and much to my surprise, I didn't recognize my own street because while I was walking, I was walking without any roof over me, without any doors, which only give you small little windows. I was one with the elements and I saw what was a beautiful street full of quaint and nice houses had become a monstrosity. There were apartments everywhere. There were apartments everywhere. And this hit me pretty badly. And so, much against medical advice, disregarding it completely, I decided that I'll drive on my wife's scooter one day and one Sunday and see how the <clears throat> other streets and roads are. I didn't recognize the city. All the structures of the city which were which gave it a character. I had always argued 
that one thing about Hyderabad is that it all it has tremendous character of its own. And I had, when I went for a ride, I did it on a Sunday so that you know I didn't have to worry too much about traffic. And I looked around, all I saw were these uniform kind of multi-storied structures and it looked like any other place. A 400 plus year old city had lost its historical structures and with it its historical charm. What we have now is a very, very poor imitation of any city that you'll find in America. So you see, most of the time, the reason why I made such a big point out of this is that it is the way we live our lives which makes us completely insensitive to the ecology, to the environment. And we are living in capsules of our own with much disregard to the natural world. So that's why I was afraid to put order there. There's no order now. It's disorder. And I had started off by saying, let me disabuse you of the notion of about organisms. I, I never completed that point. Uh, we are also organisms, as opposed to if you talk about microzoal, microbials and protozoans. Well, protozoans are unicellular, simple organisms. And uh, even elephants, which are, I'm very close in size to elephants, and that is why I talk about elephants. Elephants are also organisms. They are complex multicellular organisms. I'm making this point because some smart aleck at, at, at one time. No. When I was saying organisms, he thought organisms were small things, which is far, far away from the truth. It is very far away from the truth. So what you find is that organisms can be huge or they can be microbial. So just because we're using organisms here, it does not mean, it does not mean that, I'm sorry about this unprofessionalism. I try to keep things professional, but somehow it doesn't happen. I don't think it is meant to happen. Anyway, so, 
Uh, we are looking at these uh, multicellular complex organisms also. When we talk about organisms, and uh, when the Save the Tiger program was launched, ads came in Hindi. Much to my consternation, I found out that the Hindi word share refers not to the tiger, but to the lion. I came to know that the tiger is referred to as the bag. So there was this man, I don't remember his second name. His first name was Siddharth. Uh, can't remember the second name. Uh, he basically used to say, Bag Gaya To Zindagi Gaya because the tiger is an apex predator, well, the real apex predator, and this is not my wise crack, uh, the real apex predator is a human being below the human being in this country at least the next apex predator is uh, one which lives in the natural world uh, is the tiger and the efforts are on to save the tiger because you need all kinds of organisms to maintain the ecological balance. This is basically what uh, deep ecology is talking about. And Anness argues that uh, the earth and uh, the natural world can absorb damage to a very very limited extent, which means you cannot damage 
the natural world too much. So, if you interfere with it too much, then what you are doing <clears throat> is that uh, you're giving in <clears throat> to being a destructive species that is disrupting. This is a new word. Again, everyone uses Apple came and disrupted the phone, uh, the computer world, and Google came and disrupted the World Wide Web, and uh, Android from Google came and disrupted the cell phone market. Well, you have so many disruptions, those we can do it. But what we can't do with are disruptions to the ecological balance. We cannot disrupt this without paying a price for this. So what is in the future, which Greta Thunberg doesn't really tell you, she talks about global warming, the necessity to cut down on hydrocarbons. She tells you all that. What she doesn't tell you <clears throat> is that water is becoming a commodity or a resource, I'm sorry, it's not a commodity, is a resource <clears throat> that is gradually becoming scarce. And um, in the future, Wars will not be fought for territories. Wars among countries and wars within countries will be fought for resources like water. So that is the future we are staring into. This is not Arna Ness. This is me telling you that I'm a bit of an environmentalist myself, uh, if you haven't gathered that by now. And this destruction of the ecology is not just going to disrupt our lives. A disruption is a temporary inconvenience, but this destruction is something which will be a phenomenon that creates permanent damage a phenomenon that creates permanent damage. I told you I lost track of how old I am. My only worry is how to take care of my aged mother and my wife. I do not have children. You are youngsters. Some of you will soon have children. By soon, I mean in the next five to ten years. Some of you will have your own children. What kind of a world do you want 
to leave behind for them. I know it's, it's a it's a question that has been asked so many times. But I ask this question again because nobody pays heed, heed to it. And whenever the opportunity presents itself to me, I will keep asking this question. I'm also a believer in karma, in rebirth. And one of my fears is if I am reborn as a human being, God help me. If I have to be reborn again, and if there is a thing called rebirth, I'd rather be born as an ant or something on which somebody tramples and goes away. And it's life is over. To be a human being in this world in the future is going to be more and more and more difficult. It's not just global warming. Nobody is talking about water shore scarcity. The glaciers are melting. Perennial rivers will dry up. The revered Ganga will dry up. It's just a matter of time. How much time, I don't know. But it may happen in your lifetime. And these are concerns that you should have. So, I don't want to do what Arna Ness is basically doing, where he's saying he's going, I'm talking about the interdependency of organisms for the preservation of the natural world. I'm going beyond that. I'm saying as a human being, become responsible. Become responsible and don't fall for the garbage that is today shown as environmentalism. Electric mobility, I had talked about it some time ago. <clears throat> it's supposed to be clean. Is it? What is, where are you storing this electricity? You are storing them in batteries. Maybe they are lithium ion polymer batteries and there are more advanced batteries now than the lithium polymer ion batteries. How do you dispose these off once they become dysfunctional. A battery has a charge that only runs for a certain amount of time. The more you use a battery, the sooner it gets destroyed. It loses the potential to be recharged and reused to its fullest extent. So, that is not a solution. 
of environmentalism. Already, every three months, some phone company or the other launches a new mobile phone. And people make a beeline to Amazon or to Flipkart to buy these. This is electronic waste, which is poisonous, literally poisonous. What are we doing with it? We are burying it in dumps. And what happens over a period of time? All the poisons that are contained in these electronic devices, they are going to spread through the earth and they probably, not probably, it is a question of how much but definitely, they are going to pollute groundwater. So we're not going to be getting groundwater that is portable, drinkable. So this is what ecology is. And for this, you don't need the stupid lifeboats, swimmers, and the land ethic. You don't need all that rubbish. It's a matter of common sense. You know, I think at an average, a person uses his brain only to the extent of three or four percent. The rest of the brain is dormant. The rest of the brain is dormant and therefore it is incapable. It becomes slowly incapable of understanding issues which are simple, they don't have to be complex. They don't have to be complex. So, activate your brain cells. Go beyond what everybody goes chasing about. Go beyond the stupid cell phones, the server purpose, I agree. But you don't need them and you don't need to change them at the rate at which we are changing them. We don't need to do that. You don't have to go running to malls and consume whatever is sold through stores and malls. Because it is these things which are keeping a very small percentage of the brain active. The rest of it is inactive. Inculcate the habit of reading books. Please see channels. You get them even on Fire Stick. You get them on other devices which are trying to make television channels obsolete. But you do get these channels that will show you programs of history, programs on the natural world, 
programs on the growth of technology and the deleterious effects that it has on the world. So please be sensitive to all those things. And uh, so let me close this with what Anna Ness wanted. wants non with nature and uh, biodiversity except except for vital needs. Unfortunately, he also says, puts the blame for what is happening at the door of capitalism, which is very true. I actually believe, I'm not a Marxist, I'm not a rightist, I'm not a leftist. I don't know who I am. I only know myself by my given name, which you can see there. If anybody asks me, what are you, who are you? My answer is I'm A.B. Satish Chandra. Now, um, so Marx was the first to say that precious natural resources are wasted by capitalism because people want to stock up stores so that somebody wants something, just go and buy. I grew up at a time when there was rationing. We all had ration cards. You couldn't go and buy sugar in uh, the open market and that is not very long ago. So we had to go to the ration shop and um, we had to basically get stuff which was rationed. We needed a license for radio and television. We needed to pay monthly fee for that. I think that was a good thing. This whole pursuit of the free market, it's dumbing down generations of people. Anyway, that's it for Arna Ness, Ness. And uh, there is no need for wine and charcoal because I have taken an hour and I have a meeting 
on Zoom with some friends, uh, which is coming up in four minutes. So I'll say goodbye. Have a nice time. Please don't lose sight of the earth. Please don't lose sight of ecological balance. Don't consume things that you need to consume. I mean, you don't need to consume. And be safe. If my theory of karma is wrong, then it's really, really good for me. Because it means that I will see only a little bit more of what awaits us. While you will see more, your children will suffer. So please remember that. So thank you. And bye-bye. Tomorrow, I'll be doing talking and hopefully I'll be able to finish him in one lecture. Thank you.